Welcome to Trillions. My name is Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. Last episode, we talked about how ETFs have become such a big deal. This time, we're going to try and make sense of the chaos that they've created. Because there's 2,100 of these things. Some of them might blow up and make me rich. Others might blow up and make me poor. One a day launches in the U.S. Eric, how am I supposed to make sense of all that chaos? I don't know. No, I do know. Uh, <laughs> I'll see you next week. Look, it's it's not easy. There's 20, like you said, there's, well, there's 2,087, but who's counting? Who's That's counting? That's a good fact check. Thank you. And my job at Bloomberg for uh, half a decade was to make order out of this chaos. I looked at myself in data when I worked there before I got to research as the guy running a Walmart. Mm. And instead of stuff, it was ETFs. And I had to organize them in like a taxonomy so that when you walked into my proverbial ETF store, you knew exactly where to go and could find the ETF that you wanted and evaluate it within, say, 10 to 20 seconds. And so I'll, I'll share a little bit about what I did, but ultimately, you know, there are a lot of ETFs. Let's bring in one of the questions our listeners asked on Twitter, because it was literally about one of the topics that we're going to get to today. Yeah. So, and by the way, please tweet it at, at Eric Balchunas or at Joel Weber show. If you have any questions, we'll definitely pick some. This one was from Ken Natal, who's a financial planner in New York. He says, can you discuss the various structures in ETFs? And he says, for example, SPY versus VOO versus IVV. Which are all really basic, plain vanilla S&P 500 ETFs. Yeah, we actually touched on these in the first one. But even those three, they track the same index and they do have small differences. We'll get to it later in the show when we get to the equity aisle, so to speak. But that, I think, is indicative of the fact that there are a lot of small differences, even when you are in the same like species. So this episode, meet the ETFs. OK, so I just walked in to Eric's ETF store, which looks a little bit like a Walmart. And I've got my grocery cart here, and it's got a squeaky wheel. Can you help fix that? No, I work at Walmart. <laughs> OK, well... Maybe you can help me make sense of this store. What's your biggest department? Sure. So if you think about a department in terms of organizing ETFs, we would say that mapping would be an asset class. So when you think of departments in this ETF store, think of them divided by asset classes. The biggest asset class by far is equities in terms of ETFs. About 70% of the volume and assets are in equity ETFs. So these are ones that hold stocks. And when you go to that section, there's different aisles for different types of equity ETFs. So... When I think about how that responds for me, I think about walking into a grocery store when I was a kid and the cereal aisle was a daunting place because my mom would only let me have sugar cereal one day a week, which was Saturday. And that was when I watched Saturday morning cartoons. Poor guy. Poor guy. So I basically got to pick the one sugar cereal that I'd have for that weekend. And it was like Lucky Charms, Cocoa Puff. Captain Crunch. Oh, yeah, I and they're all that stuff. <laughs> so that was your Monday through Friday. Seven diet. days a week, 20, you know. So they're all yelling at me for my attention. And that's sort of how I feel about the equity aisle. Can you help me make sense of the ETF aisle like it's a cereal aisle? Sure. I mean, and it's a good metaphor because some of the ETFs are a little healthier for you than others. I think a basic way to divide equities is by market cap. So there could be like a large cap aisle a mid cap aisle and a small cap aisle. And within there, there's different sections, but take large cap, right? That's probably, I mean, five, six, seven hundred billion dollars somewhere in the ballpark. So I'd say a quarter of all assets are going to be in large cap. So maybe there's two aisles, but you get the idea. So large caps are going to hold names like Apple and Google, and, and those are very popular, have a lot of assets. But again, there's differences between each of the products. And again, the biggest large caps are ones that we talked about before and that we had a question about, which are the S&P 500. These are perfect example for why you need to basically, we say in the industry, open the hood, or in this case, look on the back of the cereal box, you know, forget about the cartoon character that's like, you know. Jazz handsing on the yeah, front. Yeah. yeah, that's like making you lose your mind. Uh, you turn the box over and you look at the ingredients, right? And this is sort of like looking at, okay, what are the holdings? So when you take the S&P 500, you're going to see Apple, Exxon. It's going to make you feel very safe because you're going to recognize all the companies because in the S&P 500 ETFs and most ETFs in general, they market cap weight the stocks. So the bigger ones get the biggest weighting. 
And so ultimately, when you look over at a S&P 500 ETF, you're going to see those companies. Now, the difference in the question that was asked is that SPY is the biggest, oldest ETF, right? It's got $250 billion. It's a giant. I call it the king of ETFs. Yep. You could argue it's the king of equities because it trades uh, four times more than Apple, the second most traded equity. Anyway, SPY is structured as a unit investment trust. That was how the first couple ETFs were designed in the mid-90s. And the other ones, IVV, which is iShares, and VU, which is Vanguard, are structured as open-end companies. Now, for you out there, if you haven't fallen asleep already, we're not going to spend much time in these structures, but it does make a difference in small ways. A unit investment trust, SPY, can't invest the dividends back into the fund every day, and it can't do securities lending. There's there's small little things on the margins. It's not a big deal. What I was going to say about this, it reminds me of vanilla. There are different types of vanilla. There's vanilla bean, there's French vanilla, and that's sort of what these are. Yeah, exactly. And if you pick SPY, IVV, or VU, and you held it 10 years, it doesn't make a difference, really. I mean, you're going to get the S&P 500 return minus a couple basis points. So large cap, we're talking Cheerios, grape nuts, raisin brand a little bit, maybe. Wheaties. Wheaties, good one. Let's talk about mid cap. Sure. Mid cap's a little, little. you know, I, I always refer to mid cap as the Jan Brady of market caps. Oh, really? Well, it's overlooked mm. all the time. It's the middle child. Mm. Large caps are the biggest and small caps are like, you know, they're a little more volatile. They're more fun. You can make or lose more money. Mid caps are kind of stuck in the middle. And, you know, they're, you don't hear a lot about them, but they have $100 billion. That's a pretty big section. They could be their own aisle for sure. And mid caps would be companies that I would say if you opened up an, a mid cap ETF and you looked or you went, turned the box over, looked at what's in it, you probably would only recognize a couple companies like something like Urban Outfitters, I believe, is a mid cap. I shop there, but some of these other companies that are in the energy business and industrials, you'll never You are so an urban outfitter shopper. That says it all. I uh, love that about you. Yeah, the ironic t-shirts. At least the Urban Outfitters has those ironic t-shirts before they make it to Target. <laughs> right, they're it's, two years before. So small cap, this is like the spicy stuff, okay? You know, this is like the stuff you had on Saturday. Okay. Maybe not that bad, but definitely raise, raisin bran, a little sugar on it, whatever, right? The small caps, there's actually more of them. So like... A typical small cap ETF like IWM or VB, those are the tickers for two big small cap ETFs, they're going to have 2,000 plus or 2,500 stocks. And they might even dip into what's called 2,500. Micro- yeah, that's good though, because remember we talked about diversification? You definitely want to be diversified there. With Although, the small stuff. if you pick the right small cap, small caps are ultimately like investing in like toddlers. You know what I mean? They, you know, they haven't really like, they're not mature. Oh, I know about toddlers. Oh yeah. I know. Me too. Yeah. That's why my voice is scratchy. My two-year-old, God knows what he's bringing home from daycare. (laughs) You know, as long as we're hanging out in the cereal aisle, remember those little combo packs that you could get like eight different types of cereal, like Apple Jacks and everything in one? For the field trip. And there'd always be like one left over. Yeah. That I, nobody ever wanted. Yeah, Wheaties, usually. Wheaties. Yeah. yeah, it was all the fun ones. and then yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's like the Frito-Lays of the cereal pack. What is that combo pack in your world? Great metaphor. If what, what we just said about going through different aisles and picking large caps, what a lot of people do is say, the hell with it. I just want the whole thing in one shot. And that's called broad market ETFs. They're very popular. So here is where you get the best bang for your buck, in my opinion, because you're going to get the whole stock market. We're talking about 4,000 stocks, roughly. For 0.04% or 0.05%. So if we talk about that $10,000 proverbially that you put into an ETF, here you're going to get 1,000 stocks per dollar per year. And that is a, that's almost free, basically. I mean, that talk about the pizza slice. That I could, that's even cheaper than pizza in like Kansas, let alone Penn Station. And then you're invested across all equities, right? Not just large cap, mid cap, small cap. But again, back to the whole diversification paradox. If you do that, you, you're so diversified, you're certainly not going to hit the lottery. You're just going to slowly move with the whole market. And again, some people like to, the juice of picking an individual name. But for most people, that is really a good a good deal, a good method. So broad market ETFs are hugely popular. They don't make the press a lot because they're so boring, but they are they're very popular. <laughs> Eric, that's my uh, my cart. I'm ready to go check out the next biggest section of your store, which okay. is which is what? Yeah, good, because I thought you were sick or something. But <laughs> anyway, um, the next biggest section, easily fixed income, which is bonds, right? So 
bonds can be boring. Do not fall asleep. You know, the way I try to explain bonds to people or excite them about them is that fixed income is really uh, like th- like a three-dimensional game. It's like chess, whereas equities are like checkers because bonds have a maturity date. So there's an extra time element in valuing them and stuff. But the good news about ETFs is you don't really need to worry about a ton of that. Ultimately, in the fixed income section, it's the same thing. There's highly popular areas where they just throw a bunch of the bonds in, into one shot and that's called aggregate bonds. So you said something in there that was interesting, which was maturity date, which speaks to a bond's duration. In a grocery store, that would be probably the vegetable section, right? Where this vegetable is going to go bad, right? So let's think about this because bonds are boring, vegetables are boring. I don't really want to eat them, but I'm going to. They're totally good for diversification, and that's why most yeah, portfolios that's why you have them. Right? The older you get, more, more people have more bonds than stocks. And here's the thing. ETFs have transformed fixed income because an ETF is an equity. Before, you couldn't really like interact with fixed income in the same way. You're, you're right. In fact, stocks trade on exchanges. Bonds don't. It's called over-the-counter. you got to call people. Literally. Pick in up a, a phone way, and call someone. Yeah. And I, I always tell people, I think the fixed income ETF showed – the hunger that people had for a bond exchange. People want to trade bonds like stocks. In fact, that's, again, back to ETFs. Their big advantage is they've standardized everything. Just like a USB port or a gas pump, everything now trades like equities, and that's what people like trading the most. It's the best, most transparent way to trade. So, yes, that's a huge benefit. So there's a lot of volume in fixed income ETFs, but there's also a lot of long-term investors. And the most popular area is aggregate bond ETFs, where they basically... Take a bunch of bonds, different types, treasuries, mortgages. We're talking, how many bonds are we talking here? Some have as much as 17,000 bonds, and they charge you six or seven basis points. So in a way, those are even a better bang for the buck per bond than the broad market equities. So you got an equity wrapper wrapped around 17,000 vegetables. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Maybe something like a crate of V8 juice from Costco or something. That's basically what an aggregate bond is. Just to kind of like talk about this time thing, the thing about an ETF is as the bond gets closer to maturing, the ETF has a goal and it would kick out the bond as it gets closer. It's almost like the way Walmart would just get rid of the old vegetables and put new ones on the stand. That is, again, back to the regeneration process of an index. An index is not fixed in time. It's always regenerating because it looks through criteria. Do bonds check off all these boxes? Yes, they do. They're in the index. If they don't, boom, they're out. So that is something that we need to, like, I think, make clear. Basically. So my cart only has the good vegetables in it. Yes. Okay. What other kind of bond ETFs are there? So big pop there is treasuries. Mm-hmm. Um, again, uh, boring is dirt, but they're very popular. Treasuries don't yield a lot right now. So they're, you know, a lot of people come in and out of them based on what, what, where, where rates are going. But uh, treasuries are really good as a buffer. You know, they can provide a hedge in a portfolio. Typically, treasuries go up when, you know, the SHIT hits the fan and everybody's like running around like crazy. Treasuries are usually what the flight to quality. So people have a little treasury, even though it slows you down a little. In the rough days, they can really come in handy and limit the losses on the equity side of the portfolio. What have ETFs done for them? Right. So treasuries, there's all kinds. You can get a treasury ETF where the bonds are all maturing within, you know, six months to a year. That's called ultra short term. Then there's short term, which is, you know, one year to three years about. Then there's intermediate. And then down the line, there's all, all the way ones that mature in 20 years. So it de- just depends on what your time frame is and what you want to have. The, uh, the further you go out, the more they typically yield. But that also means that they're more sensitive to interest rates. There's always a cost benefit you need to decide. And by the way, we're not advisors here. You know, this Definitely is just, not a fiduciary. Yeah. But I think ultimately in the bond space, this is where iShares rules. Vanguard's pretty big too, but iShares really, they came out with the first bond ETFs, LQD, which is the corporate bond ETF, TLT, HYG, which is high yield. They really, I think, innovated on the bond section. And when you come out first with an ETF, you typically get almost all the assets and it's hard to unseat the first to market product. So when you look at iShares, they dominate. And so most people use iShares for fixed income. But Vanguard's coming up and Schwab and State Street, they definitely have their little niches, but that's definitely the dominant brand. So, so the ag bonds, all that, that's plain vanilla stuff. There's also some stuff that's not so plain vanilla. That's right. You know, ETFs, again, uh, they've 
they've wrapped up everything, and that means sometimes they've wrapped up some things that are a little um, more dangerous than others. And one area that I think, I don't know, I think it gets a little bit more of a bad rap than it deserves, but it definitely you should tread with caution is high yield debt, otherwise known as junk bonds. These are wrapped up in an ETFs, and some people are concerned that the ETF trades like an equity, but the bonds aren't as liquid, and that's called a liquidity mismatch. You know, high yield bond ETFs have been around for 11 years and have survived many sort of market spasms and sell offs, and you know, people keep using them. They're road tested, but I, I just think it's important to know you are holding junk bonds. But keep in mind, this is the world we're living in. The Fed has suppressed rates and forced people to look for yield in some unusual places. I love the fact that these things are called high yield by professionals and junk bonds by everybody else. Junk bonds gets you more reads if you're a reporter. So, you, <laughs> you know, if you put that in your headline, you get like double the hits. So you see junk bonds more, but really professionals call them high yield. High yield means the company's more likely to default, but also means they yield more. So, you know, it's just- So you like, got that going for you. Yeah. So again, it, there's the risk reward thing in all this. But HYG is the big high yield one for my shares. Spider has J and K. It's the junk. And these yield about 5%. So compared to a treasury right now, that which is like what, two point what two percent, something like that, it's about double the yield. So because rates have been low, especially from the Fed and the, you know, the QE over the years, it's pushed a lot of regular people into high yield ETFs. But keep in mind, high yield mutual funds have way more in assets than high yield ETFs. But it is important to determine that high yield ETFs in particular, most of the things we talk about today and every day are going to be plain vanilla. I would not consider high yield ETFs plain vanilla. So Eric, we checked out the two most popular sections of your store. My toddler's crying at me. I've got this squeaky wheel on this grocery cart. Where else can I go? Well, there are smaller sections in the store for sure, but I, for some people, those are important. International, I think, is one we missed. I guess that would be in the equity section, but sort of like connected. It wouldn't be really part of it because international, some people invest internationally, some people don't, you know. But international could mean like a, an ETF that invests in developed markets or emerging or single countries. That's a pretty big area. We're talking upwards of maybe four or $500 billion as well. Um, that's a chunk right there. And then you could look at something like commodities. That really is an uh, it's asset class unto its own. And in there, you got stuff like gold is very popular. There's even silver, platinum, palladium. Then you've got like oil. There's even a corn ETF. But you say those things. A lot of that stuff makes me really scared because what business do I have buying oil? You probably don't have any. So what you're bringing up, I think, is something I talk about a lot, which is the difference between investment vehicles and trading tools. And 90% of ETF assets are in investment vehicles. Again, plain vanilla, stuff that normal people use. But 10% is in trading tools. I would put oil in the trading tool category, but I'd put gold, GLD, in the investment vehicles category. So when you're in the commodities aisle, you really, that's an extra care aisle. In fact, in my book, I had two sections. One was physically backed commodities, which is like gold and silver, more safe, and then futures-based or derivatives. So in Bloomberg, we have a field called uh, derivatives-based or not. And that's where I, I would separate them. So if you were in my store, one of the aisles would be futures commodities and one would be physically backed commodities. And the one that was futures commodities would have like a dark curtain. Yeah, I was going to say there's a guy yeah. standing, the gatekeeper, allowing yeah, you like, entrance into that section. Yeah, right? sort of like the video store. Yeah, which is a knock on ETFs. You can trade these things as much as you want, any of it. And as an investor... And especially if I'm not a professional investor, really all I should be doing is buying and holding good products. Yeah, if you can do that and withstand the temptation to trade a lot, you'll do great. And that it's hard, though. And this is one of the criticisms, especially from Vanguard's founder, John Bogle. He thinks ETFs trade a lot and therefore people are doing the wrong thing, which is trading. And, and he's trying. not wrong. They do. He's not wrong. But there's also a lot of buying and holding going on in ETFs. So again, if you can withstand the temptation to trade and you can buy and hold, you can benefit from the low cost, the lack of capital gains, which is good, and the diversification. So you get all the benefits if you can just sort of you know hold back from trading a lot. So Eric, it's time for me to escape from your ETF funhouse <laughs> and head towards the <laughs> Ooh, door. Boo. As I'm heading to the door... 
You, you're picturing me in a clown outfit right now. I am now, absolutely picturing you in a clown outfit. That is Thanks scary. for coming. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy your time? Anyways, you're, you're leaving my, my so, e- so fun yeah, house of ETFs. Why did I come here in the first place? Because this is, again, we're going to basically go way down right here. We're Meta. Gonna, we're going to break it all down. Break it down. Ultimately, investing is about participating and benefiting from capitalism, right? If you hold all these stocks, all these bonds, really what you're doing is you're just benefiting from the value created every day by people who go to work at these companies, make products, sell the products. And a lot of that value is passed on through dividends and the price of the uh, stock going up. So if you do that, you know, on average, the S&P goes up about 8% a year on average. It's gone up a little more than that lately, but that is what you're doing. It, the value created by all these companies doing these things is what you're essentially doing. And why are you doing that? Because if you held the money under your mattress, A, you wouldn't make any money, and B, you would lose money because inflation would make that money worth would less. eat it up. Yeah, so this is so you can retire, get your Winnebago, or in your case, a jet ski, right? And go and play all the bingo you want. I will take my jet ski to Florida and hit the jackpot. I'm just, you know, I can't help but picture you with a, with a nice mullet. I love that you think I'm going to be on a jet ski. That's just like too cute. I think of you as being on a Winnebago. I, I wouldn't mind that. I actually think that seems like a good lifestyle. Writing the next great American novel, you know, just going to general stores. Mm-hmm. General stores. Yeah, I like general stores. You can't get away from the competition, can you? <laughs> I know. It's like, check out what they got in their store. What kind of ETFs you got over here? Over yonder. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, and probably a bunch of other places I haven't heard about yet. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter. He's at Eric Balchunas. I'm at Joel Weber Show. Trillions is produced by Jordan Bell with help from Magnus Henriksen. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Bye.